This is a more nitty gritty talk. It's dense. Um, so I, I had to cut out some slides, so hopefully I'm within my 30 minutes. So, okay, thinking you've done everything right, why do you still get disease? So this was really especially true from last year. Last year pushed me over the edge, hence this talk, because there was some major disease issues. I had growers complaining to me. They drove me nuts, and so, and I know why they got disease, and it wasn't due to fungicide resistance. And so I figured it was important to sort of have a healthy review of why disease happens when it does. So we'll be talking about just a few diseases today, going through in depth on apple scab, uh, reviewing the disease cycle, because I like to make sure that we're all on the same page with that, optimizing protection, understanding uh, management failure, why management failure happens, and asking yourself a lot of questions when it happens. And there's some new fungicides that will be available to you this year, and then there's one next year. And then there's this new disease called Marcinina blotch that is affecting pretty much all areas east of the Mississippi. It popped up in 2017, and it's everywhere now. It's on apples. It's not exotic, but it's new for apples. I'm not quite sure where it popped up from, uh, but it's everywhere. And it can defoliate trees pretty bad. So if it, some... Uh, some little bit of information about Marcinina and then a brief update about bitter rot and management. So first with regards to apple scab, I was looking at your data at least in the Woodbine area thanks to Larilyn Farms because they have a newest station that I can tap into. Your season was a smidge earlier than ours so I'll be predominantly talking about basically learning the lessons from the Adams County growers essentially of what happened. Um, so first of all, just real briefly, apple scab overwinters season to season in, le in the leaves. It needs organic matter in order to survive. And then the spores in those leaves become mature around green tip. It's evolved that way. And so they don't all mature at once. And so you'll have, it's all depend temperature dependent and also uh, leaf wetness dependent. And as the spores mature, the leaves, when the leaves get wet, they'll be released. They are, they gradually release, and then there's a huge peak of release of overwintering spores from late pink through petal fall. Then it drops off, but this primary period, which is the spores that cause infection, um, that are, result from those overwintering leaves that cause that initial infection, this is the mo most important period. So you want to thwart this period up here because once this infection becomes established, secondary inoculum called canidia are produced, and this can cause infection and reinfection and reinfection within the, within the tree throughout the season. And so that's why it's called a polycyclic disease. So if you can disrupt this and prevent the primary establishment from happening, then you're good to go for the rest of the season. But the primary period is about two months of when those overwintering spores are available. Orchards are self-infecting. Do not blame your neighbor five miles down the road from getting apple scab. Apple scab's all you. For apple scab infections to occur, it needs the uh, ideal average temperature and so many leaf wetness hours. With apple scab, it can be pretty chilly, so do not be fooled or lulled into uh, complacency in the spring when we have cool springs. As long as you have the average temperature and enough leaf wetness hours, you can have scab infection occur. And that's happened for us when we've had pretty cool springs, but we've had some pretty wet periods. But the conditions where you want to be most mindful of is from average temperatures from 61 to 75 degrees when you have a minimum of six leaf wetness hours. That's not a lot of time especially in some of the times when we get these really prolonged rain events in the early season. It's a severe scab year when we have a rainy spring. It's not a scab year when it's hot and dry, or at least dry in the early season. Uh, in the summer, when it reaches about 80 degrees, and if you do have any scab, it seems like scab shuts down because it doesn't like those hot temperatures. But again, it's, the damage has already been done by that point. So as I mentioned, you know, when the, when the overwintering spores in those previous year's leaves mature, they are gradually released and you have this increase of a small, it's just a few spores at half inch green tip type cluster. And then you have this massive spike from late pink through petal fall when you have tens of thousands of mature spores available. This is the greatest threat, this timing for apple scab to occur if you have disease conditions present. And so after that petal fall period, 
the number of available spores drastically draw off, drop off. It's not as much of a threat, but if you have prolonged rainy periods, you still need to be worried about it. But it's this time period within here, about two weeks, that can be really, really problematic and very important to have protection on your trees, especially when if you have the correct average temperature and the right number of leaf wetness hours. So as I mentioned here, learning, for, learning the lessons from Adams County for last year. So this is the month of May. And so the beginning of May, we were still in bloom at this period. And the peak spores we had available, because we monitor this at the research station, it lasted more than two weeks. It was like a solid three and a half weeks because it was actually started probably in April and then it didn't really end until the middle of May. That was unusually long. It's like clockwork typically where it's like two solid weeks, but I believe because of the cooler temperatures last spring, we had this protracted bloom, which just seemed to kind of drag out those mature spores. So we had several weeks of mature spores being available, the max number of available spores. So if you combine with the disease conditions, it was going to be pretty, pretty terrible. And that's what we had. This was the first infection period in May. It started May 2nd, ended May 7th. So in Pennsylvania, for many growers, they really believe in alternate row middle sprays. Any folks in here spray alternate row middle? So that's when you do half sprays. It's just half side of the tree. Uh, I'm not a believer in alternate row middle sprays. And the, some Pennsylvania growers realize the limitations of alternate row middle sprays this season. Because typically what they would do, they would go in and spray, and in three days they would get the other half of the tree. Well, unbeknownst, to, well, and not unbeknownst, they should have known better, but you know, they had half of their tree that was unprotected and unfortunately becoming infected. So symptoms showed up in the middle of May. Then we had one day break and then another massive infection period during that time. And the symptoms showed up in late May. This, there were other infection events, minor ones, but this was the major one that occurred. This massive time period in the first two weeks of May during peak, peak spore dispersal that really caught people off guard. This is why, this is why we had issues with apple scab in Adams County and in other parts of the state because other parts of the um, apple growing regions in the state had similar conditions. So understanding where could one have gone wrong? Where could the grower have gone wrong last year? And as I mentioned up there, it's not due to fungicide resistance. I will show you proof that it's not due to fungicide resistance. It's all due to human influence. So we're going to review the basics of fungicides, what to spray and when, optimizing fungicide applications, and then finally asking the questions um, when scab pops up. So there's two groups of fungicides out there. You've got systemic, serpenetrants, and protectants. All fungicides work best when they're applied prior to the infection event, but they, these two groups behave differently. Your systemics and penetrants, these are called translaminar fungicides, such that they penetrate the first few layers of the leaf, the cell layers of the leaf, and get inside the leaf tissue. So that's when we say they're locally systemic. So since it gets into the leaf tissue, it can actually kill infections that may have started. So we call that kickback activity. But we don't want to, we don't get lulled into complacency with kickback activity. But it does have the ability of killing an active infection in a leaf because of its ability to penetrate. Since it can penetrate inside the leaf tissue, it, does, it can't be washed off easily because it's inside the leaf tissue. This is in contrast to protectants. This is your mancozebs, your captans, your sulfurs, your zyrams. These coat the top side layer of the leaf. It's just on the top layer. It's not going to penetrate the leaf tissue. So this one, it's very, these ones are very important. They have to be on prior to the infection event. But unfortunately, since it's on the surface of the leaf, they can be easily washed off. So depending on the fungicide, a tenth of an inch of rain can wash off about half the fungicide residue. Two inches can wash all of it off. But the stickability varies within those fungicides. And the fresher the fungicide, the more activity it will have, even if it doesn't have 100% of the residue there. Okay, so I'll repeat that again, is that even if it's a freshly applied fungicide, if you have two inches of rainfall, you may have 20% residue left, that 20% of residue is giving you 100%, near 100% protection. But that's just because it's a fresh residue. So what that tells you is that there's a buffer. You do have a buffer with these broad spectrums. And that buffer is significant when it's a sticky, one of the sticky um, fungicides. 
This is your rainfast fungicide. This is your Manzate Pro Stick, your Roper Rain Shield, your Dithane Rain Shield. Add your favorite spreader sticker to your favorite Mancozeb or Xyram. It'll make it sticky. It'll make it rain fast, so it'll stay on the leaf longer. So it gives you a buffer during rainy periods. Where you don't add spreader stickers is with Captan. Captan's naturally sticky to begin with, but on the label it says not to use spreader stickers. So as far as the ideal program to use, if you aren't already doing it, you really want to make sure you have complete sprays during that peak apple scab spore um, dispersal period, bloom through petal fall. And this is best management practice. Honestly, I want to see complete sprays all season long, but I know that's not a reality for some folks. So I'm trying to encourage people to start thinking about complete sprays during this critical period. If you can't do complete sprays, do it at least just during bloom. If you have to pick one or the other, do it during bloom because you'll get fire blight and scab control during this time period. So what to spray when? Dormant copper. Folks may want to be getting, yes. Resistance to scab? Well, just the use of it. I've read some articles about tops and M having issues uh, and not using it anymore. Well, yeah, Topsin, because of its um, because of its class of fungicides, it's it, it seems that you can build resistance to it. I like seeing, and I'll talk more about this later in relation to Topsin. There are some issues with it, particularly with bitterroot. So let me come back to it. You wouldn't use Topsin for apple scab because I think the ability for topsin or thiophanate methyl to deal with apple scab is long gone because of the name. It's the oldest fungicide out there, or that class of fungicide. So, um, but as far as, as far as taking a conservative approach, broad spectrums are, mo are important all season long, especially in the early season. So you want a dormant copper on early in the season, so folks should be thinking about that soon because it seems like the season's right around the corner. At green tip, you don't need really strong chemicals. You can get away with Mancozeb or Zyram or the Mancozeb Captam mix or throw in some silt or potassium bicarbonate. Potassium bicarbonate is good against scab and it's good, good against powdery mildew. But it's one of these products where you gotta get it on before the infection event. But it's a softer product. Uh, at tight cluster, this is the powdery mildew time. So you, again, you don't need the really expensive chemicals, but I would make sure you have your rain fast Mancozeb during this time. You could focus on throwing in potassium bicarb or sulfur to manage um, powdery mildew. Or if you want something uh, more sh stronger, frac code group three or frac code group nine. This is your Indar, your Rally, or Rally is, more, is better than Indar for powdery mildew. Inspire Super, Vanguard during this time. At, from pink through petal falls, when you want to use the frac code group seven products. These are the strongest products against scab. They're the best ones against scab. So there's a bunch of them that are available and a couple new ones that'll be in your toolbox for this season and next season. There's also a new frat code group three, which is slightly different than the other threes that are out there. And so frat code group three is like your Indar and your Rally. Um, this is a new three and I'll talk about that later. So during this pink through petal fall period, you wanna rotate with another frac group. So you wanna be practicing fungicide resistance management. As I always tell folks, spray by the numbers spray by those frat groups and rotate those numbers. In the summer, you can be, again, more conservative. Keep your intervals 10 to 14 days, depending on how much rain falls. You can get away with Captan during the whole season. Um, mix Captan and Topsin. Topsin still works for sooty blotch and fly spec. Uh, and, or Xyram, mix Captan with Xyram. When you get close to pre-harvest, if you have any fruit that's going to be in storage for any period of time, I really recommend applying Marivon, Pristine, or Luna Sensation during this time. They do have some post-harvest efficacy such that it'll keep your fruit clean of rot. It'll keep any rots that could be on there in check and not manifest during storage. Uh, be mindful of the FRAC 7 and 11 groups. So um, when you look at the label, it says max number of applications for a 7 is 4, max number of applications for an 11 is 4. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use a premix like Marivon, which is a 7 and 11, or a single, which is a Provia. They all contribute to the max number of four sprays a season. Again, this is for fungicide resistance management. How come you don't have 
thank you, Sam, in any of those sprays. Did something go I on did. where I didn't see it? EBDC. Um, that's my shorthand for Mancozib. Is EBD I'm sorry? EBDC. Oh, I'm looking. I just don't. So that's Mancozib. Oh, okay. That's yeah, so that's my sorry. shorthand for Mancozib. Okay, and then this is my right. other. From basically green tip through petal fall, you want to use a broad spectrum Mancozib, mm -hmm. a sticky Mancozib during this period, a rain fast Mancozib. Uh, or a rain fast Xyram. So there's your choices. Xyram, you'd have to add a spreader sticker. It is worth the investment. I have some growers that are grumbling that those products are slightly more expensive. Slightly more expensive versus cleaner fruit. Mm, you, that's your judgment call there. I know what I would pick. Uh, so it's worth it. It's especially get you through those really rainy periods. It gives a little, it, that residue will hang on a little bit more before you can get out there to renew your fungicide spray. So just as a reminder, again, I'm probably preaching to the choir in here. Not many folks are doing alternate row metal, but the importance of doing complete sprays during that critical time period when the max number of spores are available combined with the disease conditions, the trees have to be protected. You don't want to treat naked. And so there, there's risks with half sprays too. If there are folks in here who aren't ready to admit it to me, uh, sublethal doses. Uh, so that be mindful of that. Just because you're spraying half the tree doesn't mean that there's drift to the other side and that other side of the tree that is technically with no spray could be receiving sublethal doses. Also, if it's during bloom time, you could be giving yourself unintentional fire blight too if you're only spraying half your tree at a time. So as far as to, um, to demonstrate why I don't believe fungicide resistance is an issue for many of these people because I will show you data where I know I have fungicide resistance. I have an apple block where I had some trials in for two years in a row where I splayed Flint Extra. This is frac, frac Crowed Group 11. This is Trifloxystrobin. I mixed it with and without Manstate Pro Stick and I applied it at Bloom and Petal Fall. And these were complete sprays. And I will tell you, as a researcher, I do everything wrong except complete sprays. I don't do dormant copper sprays. I don't do anything with sanitation because I'm all about keeping my pressure high on purpose, but I always do complete sprays. So in 2018, my untreated check, this was the scab incense on fruit at harvest. I, on my untreated, 100% incense of scab. All my fruit had scab. On my Flint extra treated trees, there was no broad spectrum at all, all season. I had about 50%, 50 to 60% scab incidence. So this is how I know I've got scab, how I've got fungicide resistance is by this high incidence of apple scab. However, when I mix it with mancozib, it significantly dropped down the scab incidence. So even though I have some fungicide resistance in that block, mixing it with the broad spectrum makes a huge, huge difference. And complete sprays makes a huge, huge difference. So I have my um, sprays a week apart there in about 10 days between petal fall and first cover. I would say you wanna keep your, your intervals tight through first cover. I'd say no more than seven to 10 days. I wouldn't go more than 10 days between petal fall and first cover when um, conditions are present. You may wanna go less, you may wanna go just seven days if conditions are present during that post petal fall period. Now in 2019, it was a little different because it was pretty much wet the entire month of May. So I, again, 100% incidence of scab on my untreated, a lot more scab on my Flynn Extra only treated fruit. But I still had a lot of control in my Flint and Mancozeb treatment. So, this, so when people say I've got fungicide resistance, I was like, yeah, it's not the problem. It's like if I can get disease control by doing complete sprays and I've done everything wrong, I know I have fungicide resistance, I'm still getting control. There's no excuse for anyone. And then going back to why your people are getting scab, it's not due to the fungicide, it's due to human error. And so during this time period, I had quite a bit of rain fill. So between April 25th and May 2nd, I had half inch, and between May 2nd and May 16th, I had five inches. And to review, between May 2nd and May 16th, I had those two major scab infection periods during that time, five inches of rain. So I could have probably had less scab at the end of the season had I done one thing differently, and that is spraying in the rain. If, you have, if we have a prolonged period of warm spring rains, you want to spray in the rain. And that's even misting, not downpour, but light rain misting. You can spray in the rain, spray with your broad spectrums, Mancozeb, Captan, Sulfur. This will give you a few days protection during this critical period. And this is very, very important when you've got this prolonged period of rain, which this would have been 
very much warranted during the first two weeks of May last year. You'll get a couple days of protection. You don't want to pour, you don't want to be applying it during pouring rain. But if it's misting, that's actually great weather for redistribution on the leaf as far as the fungicide goes. Prioritize your coverage. If it's overwhelming, triage. Focus on the most problematic blocks that have scab or the most susceptible blocks that um, get scab. If there's fungicide failure, is resistance to blame? There's lots of questions we need to ask ourselves before we play the fungicide resistance blame game. The first one is, was my sprayer calibrated? And when I did uh, house calls at many orchards last year, that was the first question I asked them. Was your sprayer calibrated? And I already knew the answer because I'd already driven through their orchard. Oh yeah, my sprayer was calibrated. They were lying to my face. You know how I know? They had sour cherries, which were being harvested at the time. The tops of the sour cherry trees were yellow. The rest of it was green. That tells me that the sprayer was not reaching the tops of the trees. It was cherry leaf spot that was establishing in the tops of those trees, which means if those cherry trees were not getting sprayed at the top, then I know those apple trees weren't reaching the top either. If you get apple scab or cherry leaf spot or whatever, or any disease established in the top part of your trees, that just becomes a spore factory that's going to rain down on the rest of your tree. Very, very important to make sure that your sprayer is reaching the tops of your trees. Using surround to double check, using those wetting cards to, and hanging them in the tree and seeing where, where your sprayer is reaching. Was I using enough water? I've got many growers who think they can get away with less and that's not a good assumption. You cannot spray 50 gallons to the acre when you have large semi-dwarf trees. You can get away with 50 gallons of acre when you've got dwarf trees, but semi-dwarf trees, 100 gallons to the acre with those bigger trees. Was it rainy from bloom through petal fall? Did I use alternate row middle sprays? And even though I had growers saying yes, I was doing alternate row middle, but I kept it tight three and a half days, well, that, that went out the window those first two weeks in May because it was raining every day for two weeks during that period. So alternate row middle failed people, especially when they had half their tree uncovered, unprotected. Did I stretch my spray intervals? So um, the rule of thumb early in the season, like for that primary period, every seven days for complete sprays, every three and a half days for the alternate row middle. And, and honestly, <laughs> I know some growers may be living in their sprayers, especially if it was a season like last year, but that's the rule of thumb. Uh, did I wait too long to re reapply fungicides after a wet period? And the other question is how old were my fungicide residues? And so, that's another important thing to remember too is how old are your fungicide residues because they will break down over time. The fresher the residue, the more punch it's going to pack right before a, a rainy period. Was it a windy day when I sprayed? I know this may seem funny and ironic, but you have no idea how many sprayers I've seen where the grower is trying to hit these trees, yet the drift is going this way. So I doubt there was very good coverage that day. How fast was I driving? How, how fast you're driving your tractor is going to impact your coverage. Did I ever adjust the fan speed? And this happened to someone I knew as well. They dialed down the fan speed a little too slow because there were some obstructions up ahead. Well, guess where they got scab? In that area where they adjusted the fan speed at the wrong time. And the other um, thing to keep in mind is if, you, if your trees are in an area that may be wet longer than usual than the rest of your orchard. So areas where there's a pond or if it's a low-lying area uh, where there's not a lot of air movement, they, you know, they may have you may have more scab infection periods in this area where it's just staying wetter longer. So it's something to be mindful of. So just as a review, the most important time for complete sprays, if you already don't do complete sprays, is bloom through petal fall. If you need to pick one of those times, you can't do both, pick bloom. Uh, wet weather in the forecast, using both systemic and those rainfast fungicides. The rainfast fungicides, Manzeb Pro Stick, Manze Pro Stick, Pencazeb, Rain or Pencazeb plus your favorite spreader sticker, diethane rain chill, roper rain chill. There's a bunch out there. It's worth the extra money of investing in those sticky fungicides. Applying fungicides in the rain with those broad spectrums. Misting, light rain, not when it's pouring, but it'll pay off. And fungicide failure, ask yourself a ton of questions and be honest. Don't lie to yourself. Be honest with those answers. Uh, this is just a snapshot of what will be available to you this year. Sevias from BASF. Frac code group three, this is a really strong frac code, group, frac code group three. They say it's slightly different of the threes out there. And I saw it did a great job um, with all diseases. So this is, uh, I tested it at a, a low rate and a high rate. 
The highest rate is five fluid ounces, and that seems to work best. Uh, Miravis from Syngenta, this is another seven. Aprovia is like its sister, um, but this is different. Um, this is a different chemical. It's weak on rust. It only suppresses rust, where Aprovia seems to be a little stronger with rust. But this was a great product. And another product that will be available next year, which is Excalia from Valent, and that was pretty good as well. It did a great job. This was comparable to all the other products that are out there. And I test, I put these to them paces. I don't use a broad spectrum when I'm testing these products, so I want to know its limitations and its strengths. And they did a really good job. But don't do as I do. Do, do as I say, not as I do. And I want to make sure you're always tank mixing with a broad spectrum. So real quickly with Marcinina, um, blot, Marcinina leaf blotch or Marcinina blotch. So this has been showing up. This is how it looks on the leaf. I'll show you sort of the progression in a minute. But these are the various cultivars that I have in my research box at Freck, and there is a difference in susceptibility. It seems that the very susceptible ones, you look at them and they seem to get Marcinina, are Rome, Honeycrisp, Cameo Empire, and the scab-resistant varieties. I think the scab-resistant varieties get them because Folks aren't actively protecting their trees early in the season because they've got scab resistance. Well, that's going to change now. Uh, these seem to be moderately susceptible, Fuji Gala Red Delicious. And these folks here seem to be moderately resistant. And these trees in my one orchard were bordered by very susceptible trees, and they did not, I did not see a tremendous amount of Marcinina. So there is some moderately, res there's some resistance here. Other cultivars, not quite sure, but this is just for your radar to be mindful. So this is a progression that starts out as tiny black dots. Those tiny black dots get bigger, leaf turns yellow, and you see these dark islands. If you have a hand lens or a nifty camera to attach to your smartphone, you'll see these little tiny black dots. And you actually see those tiny black dots as early as this stage here. That's how I know it's Marcinina. It's, this is very distinct for this disease. It's very, it's so uh, another, you won't see this with another disease, especially how big those spore masses are. So just an FYI as far as like diagnostic purposes for you when you're scouting your orchard. Did you get it, Lynn? <laughs> okay, so sanitation's key. It's, I call it late season apple scab because it seems to show up late in the season. Uh, so removing overwintering leaves. If you're managing actively for apple scab, you'll be managing for Marcinina. We're not quite sure when the timing of spore release is. What's in the compendia and literature does not jive with what I'm observing, which is why I'm uncertain about the true disease cycle for us. Uh, but I just know that early season is important. Uh, so I did some preliminary evaluations last year. The broad spectrum seemed to be pretty good. I will just make a comment. Xyram 76DF is far superior than the liquid version Xyram's um, XL. So there is a liquid Xyram out there, and the 76DF seems to be strongest. Omega is a frat code group 29, but it's considered broad spectrum. This was quite fair at the lowest rate. The frat code group 3s were pretty good. Spire Super might suppress. It did well when it was tank mixed with Mancazeb. Uh, as far as the Sensation, Maravon, and Flint Extra, the premixes were much better than Flint Extra. Flint Extra did well when it was tank mixed with Mancazeb. The frat code group 7s seemed to do really, really well with Marcinina. So I, I, right here, I believe the broad spectrums in FRAC Code 7 are the strongest ones here. Topsum seems to be OK. And then softer products, I tested Cueva Double Nickel, Regalian Stargus, Regalian Badge SC. Badge SC is a copper. And Caligreen, which is a potassium bicarbonate, that came across as fair. So sulfur works. That would be the management strategy for organic growers early in the season. So quickly, for, with regards to Bitterock, because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, so uh, this is a snapshot of my graduate student Phillips evaluations. He had over 500 isolates from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and, um, and Ohio. So I just want to, so this for, for you guys here, this is the predominant species he found, this Calatotricum fiorinae. And it seems the further south you go, the more diverse the species get. And the species, it's important to know the species because it depends. This will factor in what chemicals are effective, unfortunately. It seems that there are nuances to the efficacy of the different chemicals. So in Delaware, this green is actually um, Calatotricum siemensi. This is important for later on. Uh, and then in here, it's a potpourri of, of um, as there's a potpourri of different species. So as far as the efficacy of what to use, 
it seems the areas, if there's anyone from Delaware in here, I probably would not lean on Topsin M to control for your bitter rot because we do see resistance in CMNCA, Colitotrichum CMNCA, which is at a low rate overall, but we do see it more down south. Where, it, where what would be good, where what products, Aprovia seems to do really well across all, all different species. Uh, the Colitotrichum fiorinae, which is most predominant in Pennsylvania, and we do see it in, in Maryland. Uh, Maravon is going to work really well, pristine, but the CMNCA, we do see resistance present. So there's another kind of kick in the shins there. Uh, but it is the Paraclostrobin in Maravon and pristine that's doing the heavy lifting. Uh, the trifloxystrobin, chrysoxymethyl, flinextra, lunar sensation, sovereign, these do not work. So there are nuances to even within the FRAC code, the efficacy of these products. If you do any post-harvest, and I'm not sure about folks doing any post-harvest processing, but Scholar works extremely well. Omega, we were really optimistic of Omega doing well because of our data in the lab. However, the lowest dose did not do so hot, and so I will want to try the highest dose next year. This is a really expensive chemical, but I want to make sure we have another product available, uh, another tool in our tool belt or toolbox to be able to control this disease. So the omega gave a, the lowest rate gave about 50% um, control. So just as real quick, because I'm at the end and a little bit of time over, sanitation is key across the board. There are a bunch of diseases I didn't talk about, but san sanitation is a key for everything. Copper, you're going to get a lot of bang for your copper in the early season or dorm, delayed dormant or dormancy. This will help with apple scab and fire blight. And yes, you can mix copper and oil together during the dormant period uh, and you won't have any problems. Uh, you don't want to apply copper and oil when you've got half inch green tip, but you could probably get away with it at quarter inch green tip. That oil helps is necessary for some insect control because I know many folks use oil for insect control. That's the only time copper and oil is safe to use. Uh, applying protection before the infection event for apple scab. Again, I am a broken record and hopefully I said it enough times where it is in your brain, sticking in there like a sticky mancozeb that you will invest in the sticky mancozebs if you already are not. Uh, bloom through petal fall. This is an important time, so you want frat code group sevens complete sprays during bloom through petal fall. Marcinina seems it's very important early in the season. If you're actively controlling for scab, you should be fine for Marcinina. I have no idea what the resistance thing, resistance issues are because we haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, but right now, the frat code group sevens are doing a good job for uh, Marcinina. So if you're controlling for scab, you should be good for Marcinina. For bitter rot, full season, we still don't know when the sweet spot of a, in control is, but we know bloom and petal fall seem to be important. So again, uh, those complete sprays, you'll get a lot of bang for your buck at bloom time. Uh, reapply fungicides after it rains, but remember, you be mindful of how old that fungicide residue is and also as far as how much rain has fallen. And then promoting healthy trees, and if you have management failure, ask yourself a lot of questions and be honest with yourself when you ask those questions. Okay, with that, I'm a few minutes over, but oh, oh, the most important slide, I forgot. The Penn State Tree Fruit Production Guide, our, our latest version is available. And so I think um, Mike had mentioned that he has some information where you can buy it. So this is updated every two years. If you have an old version, it's outdated. This is the most up-to-date version. So lots of new information. This is the website where you can go or you can call. There's a print version, a digital, digital version, or you can buy both. Uh, if you don't want to get, if that, if that not the right font color, just go to Google and type in Penn State Extension Tree Fruit Production Guide. It'll be the top hit. So this is it. Um, this is Mike's copy, so I'm going to leave it here. So if you guys want to take a look at it before investing in it, because I know 35 bucks can be a lot of money for folks. When you're, it's, it's just so you want to be informed of what you're buying. So here it is. Okay, with that, probably can take one question. Three questions. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it.